This week on Motor Week, Beverly French drives the Deu Musso. Ken Gibson takes an exclusive first peek at Citroen C6 concept car, and Phil Sayre drives the Volvo C70 Coupe. Strange looking thing, isn't it? It's the Deo Musso. And if it looks familiar, that's hardly surprising because Deo recently bought out Sanyong. The story goes that the chairman of Sanyong wanted to sit regally above the serfs in their ordinary cars in the traffic jams of Seoul. Hence, the Musso has the upper body of an estate and the lower body of an off roader. The problem is, it ends up looking a bit confused, and the new grill and lights added since Deo took over don't really help matters. Maybe we're being a little harsh and just need to see it as the serfs were intended to, from the waist up. What do you think? Nah, still doesn't work. Well, the driving position feels more like an estate than a sit-up-and-beg off-roader. Staring ahead, you face with a rather large steering wheel, which still has the Sanyong logo in the middle. Now, it's only adjustable for height, which is fine, but for taller drivers like myself, you may find it a little close for comfort. Sitting behind, you've got a large binnacle with clearly seen instruments. But as for this, they look like wood on camera, but it's actually cheap, nasty plastic, and it spreads all along here through to the center console. For a car with luxury pretensions, this could do better. Sitting down here is a stereo with enough fiddly buttons to need too much thought on the move. And if that isn't enough, it's positioned so low down that you'd have to take your eyes right off the road. Back here, there seems to be plenty of leg room and the passengers are actually perched higher than those in the front who sit quite low. Great visibility for those backseat drivers. The Musso is loaded with security devices and if you haven't got your wits about you, it can be so secure that you can't even drive it yourself. Firstly, you take this immobiliser key, put it in here not once, but twice. Now you've got 30 seconds before it cuts you off again. Moving off, you first notice that the 2.9 litre turbo diesel is a little sluggish. 18 seconds to 60, sluggish. Which would be fine if it were refined, but it isn't. It starts off noisy and rises to a racket. The petrol versions are said to be quite quick for a 4x4, so maybe that's the way to go. That said, you should get about 30 miles to the gallon from the oil burner, compared to 23 for the 2.3 petrol. The thing I really like about it is that you get to be this high up. But saying that, give me a tractor and I'm happy. Comparing this car with my dad's Nissan Patrol, for example, it feels a little bit flimsy for a 4x4. I think the Patrol feels a very solid drive. This just doesn't quite cut the mustard. So, to the crucial supermarket run. Well. Don't ask me to park this. I can't see the front corners at all. And if other lady drivers feel the same way, then Deo are losing potential customers. The back's a little easier with the squared off rear, but it's not ideal. In here, there's loads of room. There's even some very useful luggage hooks here. Now, we noticed that the luggage cover here actually sags quite badly in the middle which it's not vital but it does mark the muffo down on paper the musso is a brave attempt at a new type of off-roader and prices aren't bad either the 2.3 petrol comes in at 18,000 and this diesel comes in at 19,000 which is freelander territory Plus, you get Deo's brilliant three-year package. Unfortunately, detail, finish and questionable looks are what let them or so down. Nice try, but they don't get a prize. Citroen have been in the design doldrums for a little while now. 
they've been doing okay cars, but they had a reputation for doing really innovative, quirky type of cars that were different. Well, the good news is that they look as if they're about to come back with a really big bang, because this dynamic new C6 is the face of Citroens of the future. Mark Lloyd, you're the chief designer of the uh, team that developed the C6. What are its special qualities that will persuade German buyers to ditch their BMWs and Mercedes for this French car? Well, our objective was to produce a profile of volume which was very distinctive, uh, which would stand apart from the current uh, products and could not be confused as a product coming from any other manufacturer. Uh, this had to be a Citroen, it had to be perceived as a Citroen. What were the special design cues that you were looking for that would make this so much more distinctive? It's characterised by uh, its long front end, uh, the very long wheelbase, which gives us a tremendous amount of interior space, and then the short, compact rear, which contains an element of surprise, which is something that we found looking back at our heritage, looking back at our past, which is contained in products such as the DS and the SM. There's always this surprise. We were looking to capture a dynamic and fluid spirit uh, for the front of the car. A traditional grill would have been totally out of place and so we've developed this theme based on sliding grills, sliding louvers which open up in order to allow the car to cool and then also we've integrated the emblem, the two chevrons, into the grill to make a very strong impact. The car's character is these long flowing lines that come right to the rear of the car, the short compact rear, but then the element of surprise and drama which is so characteristic of Citroen is this expansive sheet metal with this negative rear screen which suggests space for luggage. The idea for the interior was simple sophistication. Um, we feel that interiors have become very complex in automobiles and there's going to be a big effort to simplify the interface between the driver and the machine. This is the car that Citroen hope the C6 will aspire to, the legendary DS. This car is nearly 30 years old and it looks absolutely stunning still today. It actually still looks rather futuristic. Citroen, when they did this car, were at the very, very top of the design tree. If the C6 turns out to be as successful as the legendary DS, Citroen will be more than happy. The DS was launched in 1955. It caused an overnight sensation because of its dramatic styling and its technology advances. It was a car that brought pneumatic suspension that gave the Citroen a magic carpet style ride. So, can the C6 seriously threaten the German aristocracy and their domination of the luxury car sector? I think they've got a good chance because most importantly, it's very individualistic in a typically French type of way. The Daihatsu Quar. Quar. Well, however you're supposed to pronounce it, I've got to say I wasn't looking forward to driving this. Now, I don't have a problem with small cars. They're the way forwards if we're going to beat city congestion. They're often economical and frugal, so they're good for the environment as well. They're a good thing. It's just that I personally don't want to be seen in one, and particularly not in this one. The core is Daihatsu's answer to the Mini, but then we do have to bear in mind that the Daihatsu Move was their answer to the MPV. There are reasons for the rash of teeny tiny cars that have come from Japan over recent years. The tight limitations on space in Tokyo led to the K-Class, a special class of tiny car on which owners are given substantial tax breaks. Being of an inventive nature, Japanese designers soon started coming up with novel packaging solutions and so gave us the delights of the Move, the Suzuki Wagon R and the Suzuki Cappuccino. But those size restrictions have been relaxed slightly, allowing bigger vehicles to be developed. So where European manufacturers scaled down to the city car, the Japanese are actually scaling up. 
Of course, the town is the Quar's natural territory, the school run, the daily commute, and of course, the supermarket dash. Welcome to the Trolley Grand Prix. First up, our traditional trolley. Well executed for the trolley, but what can our little Daihatsu Quar do? And then we come to the parking test. No doubt about it, these compact dimensions have advantages. No parking spaces, simply rack it up with the rest of the trolleys. Well, it's one thing keeping it cooped up in the town all week, but at the weekend, you've got to escape to the countryside. Let the little critter stretch its legs a bit. It's only fair. It's got a one-litre, three-cylinder, twin-cam, 20-valve engine. And that three-cylinder bit is very important. Firstly, it's extremely economical, barely uses any fuel at all, and very clean burning indeed of the fuel that it does use. But best of all, it's got an incredible amount of torque. Just stick it in third gear and leave it. It'll pull from no revs for round town. That's really, really useful. And also being a three-cylinder, it means it makes the most hilarious noise. It's a really distinctive triple engine, though, which is huge fun. Couple that to the surprising performance from it, and even I have to admit, it starts to look rather interesting. It may only be a tiny little car, but they had to have placed a big emphasis on safety, so we get passenger and driver airbags as standard. ABS is available as an option, and later on, probably next year, you'll be able to get an anti-skid control. I don't know if you really need that in a car like this, but you'll be able to get it. The driving position is a little compromised, as you would expect. You do start to realise it's a budget car at that point. The seats feel, frankly, cheap and there is limited lumbar support. On the plus side, the steering wheel is in about the right place and the gear change, a bit not cheap, but very usable and certainly doesn't ever feel muddled. Cars in the Japanese K-Class are gaining a reputation for making excellent use of internal space, and the Daihatsu Kuo is no exception. Thanks to a steeply rate windscreen and a near vertical tailgate coupled with a high roof line, there's actually plenty of room in here, headroom for passengers front and rear. Six-foot drivers may find it a little bit of a tight fit in here, though. Certainly they may find their knees knocking up against this panel here on the door that houses the controls for the windows front and rear. Looking around the cabin, the plastics used, well, may not be quite up to the standard and quality of those found in, say, an Audi, but they do look good. There's a nice finish to the material on the dashboard, and they feel pretty durable, too. Bad ideas? Well, they include things like a cubby hole in the centre console with no lip, so that anything put in it immediately falls out under even the mildest of acceleration. Good ideas include a rather nifty cup holder, and actually, surprisingly, quite a nice stereo's been fitted as well. It's a small car, but there's plenty of room inside. It's very economical, but entertaining to drive. It has some of the same safety features that you find on cars ten times its size, and it makes a fantastic noise. In short, if you have a son or daughter who's just passed their test and you're in the fortunate position of looking to buy their first car, it's perfect. The fact that they wouldn't be seen dead in it is a bit of an issue. I've got to be honest, I am occasionally. I came to this test not expecting to like the core a great deal, and I've been delightfully surprised. Not only is it a £7,000 car that shames many a £10,000 car, but also thanks to its intelligent use of space on the inside and its characterful little three-cylinder engine, it offers ten times the personality of pretty much any of its competitors. I hope that Daihatsu sell them by the bucket load. Quo. In part two of Motor Week, we bring you the Volvo C70.
So now Volvo have built this, a sports coupe. It's called the C70. As you might guess, it's based on the 70 series saloons and estates. The looks are absolutely fabulous, aren't they? It really gives the right impression of speed and performance and capability. And yet at the same time, here at the front of the car, this grille and the shape of the bonnet is certainly reminiscent of a more traditional Volvo feel that should appeal to those other buyers. The C70 is the outcome of a joint venture between Volvo and the British automotive specialist Tom Walkinshaw Racing, TWR. Basically, Volvo laid down the overall project requirements, such as safety and environmental concerns, to make it a true Volvo, while TWR applied their specialist car knowledge to the engineering of the vehicle. From an appearance point of view, the car really does achieve what it aims to do, which is to look smaller than it is. That is actually the knack with a sports coupe. You've got to make them look smaller, but this is quite a big car, with, incidentally, a big boot, should you be wishing to take anybody away with you for the weekend. Again, from the back, the appearance just can't be faulted. It's a gorgeous-looking beast, and I'm pleased and proud to say that it was designed by an Englishman by the name of Peter Horbury, who was told by Volvo, go out and build a car that people really want to get in and drive drive and own, which seems like a good idea and maybe stating the obvious, but perhaps not so obvious when you think about the older Volvo ethos of let's build a vehicle which is functional almost to the point of being utilitarian. However, once you get inside it is a different story. I really, believe me, had hoped to avoid any references to accountants in grey suits because I'm talking about a Volvo, because I think that's a cheap shot. But really they're asking for it because there is just acres and acres of grey here, almost unrelenting grey. The carpets are grey, the seats are grey, the headlining is grey, the dashboard is grey, the doors are grey, everything in here is grey. Which is a great pity. There are some little bits of walnut in here just to liven things up a little bit, but again, for a car with sporting pretensions, to me that is hopelessly out of place. Now, the dials on the dashboard, grey incidentally, are very functional, very easy to read, not so the switch gear. Not only the switch is grey, but they are also a mishmash of rotary switches and rocker switches and they are hidden down here behind the steering wheel. Whoever had that idea wants shooting. Also, if you are a smoker and you open this ashtray, you have just covered up the switches for these heated seats. Go figure. Now the seats are glorious, probably the best in class, par excellence, and if you pay them a little bit of extra dosh, they'll even make them full leather like these are. OK, that's what it looks like outside and in, now let's see what it drives like. If you aren't going to consider buying one of these cars, you really have to ask yourself what you want it for, because this is not by any means a car to go camping in for the weekend with mum, dad, two kids and a Labrador. The legroom and the headroom in the back, because it's a coupe, is fairly restrictive. OK for fairly small people, but tall people might just have a bit of a struggle. There are two chassis settings, lowered sports and normal touring. And there are three engines to choose from. They're all five-cylinder engines. The 2.4-litre produces 170 brake horsepower, which takes it from 0 to 62 miles an hour in around eight seconds. Then there's the light-pressure turbo 2.4-litre T with 193 bhp on tap, or the 2.3-litre T5. Despite being a slightly smaller capacity, it is actually a more powerful engine, offering 240 bhp, taking the car from 0 to 62 in around 7 seconds. This car is fitted with the least powerful of the three engine options. When I say least powerful, remember there's still 170 bhp under the bonnet, and that's more than enough to whistle it along in great comfort and style. And on the motorway, it's particularly quiet and peaceful in here. Round the bends on the country roads, it doesn't feel quite so comfortable, I have to say. But then this is the touring chassis. There is a lower sports chassis also available. That said, it's a beautiful car to drive, but there are one or two shortcomings that you may just feel uncomfortable with. For example, throw it too hard into a bend and the back end gets decidedly skittish. Feels to me like they need to firm up the dampers a little bit. Volvo, like most of the prestige marks, has been very generous with the range of equipment offered as standard with the C70 Coupe. This includes alloy wheels, anti-lock brakes, a pollen filter, electric and heated door mirrors, and a very powerful stereo with CD player, now you're talking, that's just perfect for pulling up at the traffic lights. Oh, and if you want even more toys to play with, the list of extras is enormous. I have a copy of it right here. 
The GS pack will add a sunroof, a stereo with even more bells and whistles, traction control, driver information system and heated front seats, the list goes on, and that's £1,500. Automatic gearbox, just over £1,000, electric front seats, £1,100, <laughs> metallic paint, 400 quid. cup holders, £20. I could afford those. And a satellite navigation system, two and a half grand to you, Chief. If you really want all the extra poke that that big turbo can offer you, the C70 T5 is yours for £31,000 plus options. But you know, I'd say the best value is this one, the 2.4, £25,500 on the road, and frankly, more than adequate power for this chassis at 170 bhp, taking the car from 0 to 62 in 8.5 seconds. Now that's only 1.5 seconds slower than the T5, which is £5,500 more. The C70 range starts at £25,500 and it's easy to spend well over £30,000 buying one of these cars. Now that puts it up against some pretty prestigious names in the business. And I wonder what that might do to future residual values. Do people see Volvo as a sporting brand? Possibly not, unless they can remember back to the 1960s when it was a Volvo coupe that carried Roger Moore, his eyebrows and his halo through many an exciting episode of The Saint. But this car essentially is a compromise, because you can buy much better performance and handling for your money, and on the other hand you can buy plenty more luxury for your money. It is, if you like, a car with a grey suit, but some red braces underneath when you open the jacket. Maybe that's what the C really stands for. Compromise. Motorweek News. Renault have revised their successful Scenic model, External changes focus on new headlamps and a revised grille, which give a more distinctive look. Under the bonnet, the key change is a new engine, 140 brake horsepower, 2-litre engine with variable valve timing. This effectively makes it the first hot Mini MPV, and it's the first time Renault have used this technology. We'll be driving the all-new Scenic soon on MotorWeek. Next week on MotorWeek. Phil Sayer swanks in in a Mercedes CLK. Chris Goffey compares the 406 and the C70 Coupe. 